Hello everyone. So as we agreed in the lecture, we're going to cover this chapter as an online lecture. Hopefully this will give us an opportunity to review more the material uh, in the lab and especially the models before our upcoming test. So we will then in this lecture the different types of articulations, different, type of, different types of joints. Uh, we will realize we have joints that are separated, uh, the, the bones are separated from each other by fibrous tissue, then it would be fibrous joints or cartilaginous tissue, and that would be cartilaginous joint. And we will have um, joints that are separated from each other by a fluid called the synovial fluid. We're going to talk about that in more details later on. Another way to classify the joints is the mobility of that joint, whether it's immobile, doesn't move at all like your teeth or like the sutures in your skull or it moves slightly like um, the symphysis pubis moves slightly or it moves widely and that will be like the synovial joints and like your shoulder and your elbow all the synovial joints essentially so um, let's talk about that and then we will just refer in the, at the very end to diseases and aging of the joints, what can happen wrong, all right? So we will also talk in this chapter about certain types of joints, certain, certain joints, uh, such as your temporomandibular joint, um, uh, sternoclavicular joint, your shoulder joint, and your elbow joint that's in the upper limb. Then we will talk about your hip joint uh, and your knee joint, also your ankle joint. We'll talk about these joints especially. We'll give a good attention to the different types uh, or the different ligaments that tie the bones together so you don't end up with dislocation. Sounds good? So let's go ahead and start this lecture. So um, the articulation is defined as whether it's a bone separated from another bone by something, right? And or it's separated from a cartilage, or it's separated from a tooth. Uh, and that is a very special type. If you consider the teeth are specialized kind of bones, and so how the maxilla and the mandible form the joint between the bone and the teeth, we will have a specialized, specialized kind of joint there called gomphosis we'll see that in a little bit. So the articulations vary in the stability and mobility. So uh, it's obvious that the more, uh, the less mobile the joint is, the more stable it is. So there is an inverse correlation between the stability and the mobility as we will see. So different types of joints, um, like I said, between a bone and another bone, and we can see an example here as a suture. Uh, we see the joints between the vertebrae, the intervertebral joints. There are different types of intervertebral joints. and We're not going to spend too much time talking about the different types. But there are types, there are joints between the articulating facets, and these would be synovial joints. But there are also the intervertebral discs, and that will be a kind of um, fibrocartilaginous joint or symphysis joint. So we'll talk about these guys. And here is an example where a bone is not really separated from another bone because you can see this is a really long cartilage here. So we'll consider that a bone articulating with a cartilage and here is another bone articulating with a cartilage. That's what I meant by the classification here that we can have a bone meeting a cartilage that would be considered also a joint, okay? so. Like I said earlier, there is an inverse correlation between the mobility and the stability. The mobility is how much you move. Uh, the wide range of motions, wide range, not that much motion, like the sutures, your teeth, you don't really move your teeth that much unless they're loose and they're about to fall. Uh, the stability, uh, the shape will affect the stability. Also, we have joints that will, the, the ligaments will affect the stability. Uh, we have lots of muscles that are intended to stabilize the joint. 
And so we know that the more mobile the joint is, the less stable. And so you can compare like the shoulder to your skull. Uh, you never hear of someone dislocating his um, skull bones, but you hear a lot about people dislocating their shoulder, okay? So as I said, there is an inverse correlation between the mobility of a joint and the stability of the joint. All right, how do we name the joint? Well, it depends. Sometimes the joint will have its own name, like um, hip joint, shoulder joint, elbow joint. But in anatomical terms, you can also name it according to the bones that articulate. So like sternoclavicular joint, or radioulnar joint, or uh, glenohumeral joint. Uh, um, so that's the shoulder joint. Um, so, but sometimes we uh, name them with like elbow or rest joint or ankle joint, okay? All right, so here are some examples. Um, so here is the sternoclavicular joint, here is the glenohumeral joint, which is the shoulder joint, um, a chromioclavicular joint, uh, that's between the acromion and the clavicle, uh, humeral ulnar, humeral radial, radio ulnar, proximal radio ulnar, distal radio ulnar, so the name comes here from the bones that are separated from each other by this kind of articulation. So classifying it, um, the structure, first of all, what separates the bones from each other? Is it connective tissue? Is it a lubricant? That's the synovial fluid. Is it um, um, fibrous connective tissue? Is it cartilage? Um, and then the other classification, as we will see, is how mobile it is. Is it uh, immobile or is it uh, slightly, excuse me, is it slightly mobile or is it highly mobile? So we'll see that classification as well. So let's see here some examples of, um, of um, joints. And here the bones are really separated by bone. And so it is uh, synostosis. Synostosis, it means really the bones are embedded between the bones and like here in the frontal bone as you saw in our models you saw one of the model has two separate frontal bones whereas most of the models we studied together had fused uh, frontal bone nevertheless if it's bone here that's present in what used to be a suture then we would call that synostosis and definitely this is not really a mobile kind of a joint so the category of it will be synarthrosis. Synarthrosis, it means a joint that does not move, okay? In other instances, we will have the bones separated by fibrous connective tissue. And so if it's a suture, like the one that we saw in the, the ones that we saw in the skull, we'll call that synarthrosis as well as the function because they're not mobile, but the type we will call that a suture. We'll also have a joint between our mandible and the teeth and between our maxilla and the teeth. And we'll call that gomphosis. We're gonna see that in a little bit with better pictures. And that's also not mobile, so we will call that synarthrosis. So we agreed that synarthrosis is the immobile type of joints, whether it's between bones or bones and bones, and then we have bony tissue uh, filling the gap or bones and bones, and then filling the gap, we have fibrous connective tissue, but the shape of the suture, the shape of the joint, will indicate that this joint is not really mobile, it's not going anywhere. And the same thing between our teeth and our mandible or the maxilla, we have the gomphosis, which are also synarthrosis. So I gave you three examples here of synarthrosis, and we're gonna talk about them in more detail. But then we can also have a little bit longer fibrous connective tissue that is linking the bones together. And we call that syndesmosis, like between the radius and the ulna, like between the tibia and the fibula. Um, that is long enough to allow some kind of movement between the two bones. It's not that much movement. So we'll call that amphiarthrosis. Arthrosis is joint, so amphi is slightly mobile joint. Sounds good? Sin is immobile joint. Sounds good? Cartilaginous joint, on the other hand, it can be either or. It can be 
the type of joint that you will have what we call synchondrosis, uh, like between the shaft of your uh, lung bones and your growth plate, your your um, your epiphyseal plate, um, or metaphysis. Um, that type of joint is between bone and a cartilage, but it's a high-line cartilage, keep in mind that. And we will call that synchondrosis. So synchondrosis is the type of joint that bones are separated from each other by high-line cartilage, and it's really not mobile, uh, like a growing bone. A growing bone, you can't really move the epiphysis from the diaphysis. They are stuck together. Okay? Compare that to something else where you don't have high-line cartilage, but you're going to have uh, fibro cartilage. And then we call that symphysis. Symphysis is the type of joint. It's a cartilaginous joint, but it doesn't have high-line cartilage. It's going to have fibro cartilage. The fibro cartilage um, is more shock absorbent. It's not going to break, and it allows slight mobility like when you're bending your back, that's slight mobility. Where do we have that, which we call symphysis? We're gonna have that between the pubic bones, and we call that symphysis pubis, and we're gonna have that between our vertebrae. That's the intervertebral disc, will be the cartilage that separates the two um, vertebrae from each other. How much motion I have in that joint? Not much, and that's why we call it amphiarthrosis. Sounds good? So we have now two examples of amphiarthrosis. One of them will be a fibrous joint and the other one will be a cartilaginous joint. You see, whether it's amphiarthrosis or synarthrosis, it's not really what separates the joints from each other, but it's the mobility of that joint. Okay? Synovial joints, mainly they are diarthrosis. That means they are really mobile. Uh, but we have some exceptions to the rule where the mobility is fairly limited. And we're not going to describe those, um, those uh, rare types of articulation, but just keep in mind that not all the synovial joints are freely mobile. Sometimes they allow very, very little move motion, and I wouldn't call that uh, diarthrosis. Very rare types. Anyhow, for most of the cases, we have diarthrosis. And um, the synovial joints, they can be moving in a single direction, single axis. Uh, we'll call that monoaxial, or biaxial, or triaxial. We will see the different types in a little bit. Then what makes the synovial joint a synovial joint is that the gap here is filled by uh, a synovial fluid, a lubricant and each of the bones will be, the articulating bones, will be covered by a very thin layer of a cartilage that looks a lot like high-line cartilage, although it has some differences. All right, so, like I said earlier, uh, the structural classification of a joint will be either that the bones are separated from each other by cartilage, or they're separated from each other by fibrous connective tissue, or separated from each other by fluid, synovial fluid. All right. When it comes to motion, as you saw in the table earlier, the joint may be immobile, and we call that synarthrosis, or slightly mobile, and we call that amphiarthrosis, or freely mobile joint, and that will be diarthrosis. So synarthrosis, diarthrosis, and and amphiarthrosis. Okay, let's start with the fibrous joints. We agreed earlier that the fibrous joints can be either synarthrosis or amphiarthrosis. Okay, so we have three different types of fibrous joints. One of them is the gomphosis. That's the one we have between our bones and the teeth. That means between the mandible and the teeth, the socket. Uh, of the tooth and the tooth itself. Um, the teeth are connected to your um, bones by 
very short ligament and uh, fibers and we would call that the periodontal ligament that's why our uh, dentist if you went for tooth extraction they have to knock the teeth uh, right left back and forth in order to finally break all these connections all these um, little connections between the teeth and or the tooth and its socket before they can successfully extract it so again the gomphosis is a kind of immobile joint between the tooth and the alveolar margin, the, 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 the socket, uh, whether that socket is in the mandible or in the maxilla. Sutures, on the other hand, they are, as we saw in the skull, they are between the bones of the skull. We don't have sutures anywhere else. Whereas syndesmosis, between parallel bones, where do we have parallel bones? In the forearm and in the leg, uh, between the radius and the ulna and between the tibia and the fibula, we call this kind of connective tissue interosseous membrane, the membrane between the two bones, interosseous membrane. So most of them are immobile, the gomphosis is immobile, therefore it's syndesmosis. The sutures are immobile, therefore it's syndesmosis. I'm sorry, uh, synarthrosis, now I'm mixing things up. So once again, the gomphosis are not mobile, they are synarthrosis. The sutures are also synarthrosis, and whereas the syndesmosis, they are slightly mobile, therefore we will call them amphiarthrosis. So gomphosis and sutures, these are synarthrosis, and the syndesmosis will be amphiarthrosis. So here are our types. Here is the gomphosis, and we can see between the socket here and the tooth, we're going to have series of connective tissues here that line the two together, tie the two together, and but they are not long enough to allow mobility, um, and therefore this kind of joint, which we call gomphosis, is an immobile joint or what we call synarthrosis. Uh, here is a suture, for example, between the frontal bone and the parietal bone, and that also the bones here are linked together in living uh, tissue with connective tissue, very short collagen fibers, and these will be also immobile. That therefore, it's another example of what we call synarthrosis. Now, between the parallel bones, and whether these are in your forearm or in your leg, um, we will have interosseous membrane, and that will create to us a more mobile kind, but not that mobile kind of a joint. So we'll call this kind of joint that we have here syndesmosis, syndesmosis. Sounds good? All right, now we go to the cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joints, the bones are separated from each other by cartilage. There is no joint cavity, and we have two different types of cartilaginous joints. One of them is called synchondrosis. In synchondrosis, the bones are immobile, and they are joined together by hyaline cartilage. Like what? Like the epiphyseal plate, the growth plate. The bones are separated from each other by the growth plate. The epiphysis and the diaphysis are separated by the growth plate, but the ends do not move from each other. So that's an example of synchondrosis where the bones are joined together by hyaline cartilage. That's an important thing to remember here. And whereas the symphysis, the bones are separated from each other by a pad of fibrocartilage. cartilage. Remember, in each case, it's separated by cartilage. Here, it's hyaline cartilage. Here, it's fibrocartilage. cartilage. This one is slightly mobile. So you remember what we call slightly mobile? Amphiarthrosis. Whereas immobile joint will be synarthrosis. Okay? And so here are our examples. So here is a highline cartilage separating the bones from each other, and that, of course, is a synarthrosis uh, in type, but synchondrosis in the structure. So synarthrosis, again, is physiologically it's synarthrosis, but anatomically it's synchondrosis. If you remember, chondro means cartilage, 
So synchondrosis is this type here where we have the bones separated from each other by hyaline cartilage and they are immobile. Another joint here, so you can see also between the ribs and the costal cartilage. The costal cartilage are hyaline and therefore that also a type of synchondrosis. Whereas the sympsis, uh, it's containing fibral cartilage and the fibrocartilage cartilage as example here between the vertebrae, the intervertebral disc. We're gonna talk about that in more details in a little bit. And also between the two pubic bones and we call that the symphysis pubes. Okay? So what about the synovial joints? As we said physiologically, it's mainly diarthrotic joint. That means it's mainly freely mobile joint. Now anatomically you will realize that the structure is different. We have a joint cavity. And because we have a cavity, and this cavity will be filled with a synovial fluid, that has to be contained or else this is gonna leak. So we do need a capsule. Those three we didn't have before. We didn't have capsule in the other joints. Uh, we didn't have a cavity and obviously we did not have synovial fluid. The articular cartilages they are highly similar to highline. There is slightly different characteristics, but let's call it highline anyways. They just have more water and they have more fibers here. So they're not fibrocartilage, but they are not really highline yet. They contain much more water and that's why they are more shock absorbent because they are more hydrated but that's a slight difference but let's call it high line anyways and so because this kind of a joint moves a lot we agreed that the synovial joint like your shoulder like your elbows like your wrist they move quite a bit so you would like to stabilize them you would like to stabilize the bones to each other in order not to dislocate that joint and therefore you will see that here we will start to use some ligaments and because the joint will require some fluid, so that fluid has to circulate, so you will need some more blood vessels to supply that joint. And as we all know, it is supplied by nerves. Uh, we know that when we have injured the joint, then it's painful. We know in, in, uh, in uh, arthritis, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, um, it is highly painful so the synovial joints are of course innervated okay so here's a typical synovial joint here is a bone and here's another bone and the end of the bone will be covered by what looks like highline cartilage so here is highline cartilage articular cartilage here and articular cartilage there sounds good then we have the capsule the capsule will have two layers one of them is outside and that's fibrous layer of the capsule. And the other one here is a thin membrane called synovial membrane. That synovial membrane, it covers part of the bone and then it reflects itself on the rest of the capsule, the fibrous capsule, and then it covers part of the bone. But it does not cover, it does not cover the cartilage. It does not cover the cartilage. Sounds good? So the synovial membrane is the one, the cells in it are the ones that will secrete to you the synovial fluid, creating what we know as the joint cavity, all right? In addition to that, outside the capsule, you can have ligaments, you can have um, uh, bursae, we will talk about the bursae in a little bit, but these are additional things outside, outside the joint. All right, so, as I said earlier, the articular capsule, the capsule that holds the synovial fluid inside will have two layers, outer fibrous layer, that's dense regular connective tissue, if you remember from our chapter number three or four, four I think, and uh, inner layer, which is the synovial membrane. Synovial membrane will secrete to you the synovial fluid and the function of the synovial fluid to lubricate and nourish the cartilages, not the bones. Remember, the bone is not really uh, exposed to your synovial fluid. So again, the function of the synovial fluid will be the lubrication and nourishing of the articular cartilage. 
and it also acts as a shock absorbent and during the compression of the joint which is very good and that's why sometimes we need to warm up before running before big exercise uh, because when you warm up the joint uh, when you start little by little to uh, not immediately run fast but like warm up uh, that will increase the synovial fluid in your joint and by increasing the synovial fluid in your joint then you are creating more shock absorbent um, area and therefore you have lesser chance of hurting your cartilage and lesser chance of developing arthritis later on. So it's very good to warm up before running or before playing football or playing whatever um, sport you will play. Like I said, this will loosen the ligaments a little bit, will loosen the tendons a little bit, will lengthen the muscles, but will also increase the synovial fluid and therefore you have more shock absorbing power of that joint okay the articular cartilage is almost a highline cartilage like i said it has more fluid has a little bit more fibers but let's call it a highline cartilage anyway and that prevents the bone to bone contact uh, during compression of a joint that is destroyed by arthritis whether it's osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis in rheumatoid arthritis there are antibodies against the cartilage and will start to destroy um, uh, many of the synovial joints and the like. Okay, the ligaments will connect bone to bone and compare that to the tendons. The tendons will, com will connect muscles to bones. So again, ligaments connect bones to bones and tendons connect muscles to bones. Why do we have ligaments? Because we need to strengthen and reinforce the capsule. Why would we do that? Because the synovial fluid, uh, the synovial, I'm sorry, joint is the type of joint that is mobile. And if you remember earlier, we agreed that a mobile joint is not that stable. So you would like to make sure it's stable by adding more ligaments. Uh, we know that the synovial fluids will have nerve supply and like I said when you injure a joint or when someone has some arthritis um, it feels the pain but we also need to feel not just the pain but the sense of position which is important when you are standing and uh, your cerebellum would like and the brain would like to get some information the rest of the brain would like to receive some information about the position so you can correct it if needed right uh, we call this kind of sensation proprioception proprioception is the sensation of the deep sensation of position all right uh, it is of course supplied by blood vessels and you in that case with the blood vessels you nourish the tissues in your joint like the capsule for example okay so that wraps it up for um, for this, uh, oh, we will still talk about the accessory structures of the synovial joint, and then we will um, make another video for the specialized types of joints and, uh, and the different movements. We had the different movements before, so we're not gonna repeat that, the flexion, the extension, um, abduction, adduction, all of that we have dealt with before. But the only thing left in this uh, file that I'm creating to you now is to discuss together the accessory structure. In uh, the accessory structures, these are structures are, are outside the joint. They're not part of the joint, but they are helping the joint. Like what? Like birdsy. Birdsy are sacs or cushions of, uh, of uh, synovial membrane that is filled with the same synovial fluid that you find inside a joint. Why would we have that? Well, we will have that where there is a lot of abrasion, like um, between the, your skin and your knee, between your skin and your elbow, uh, between your skin and your um, humerus, uh, 
or up in the shoulder or between the skin and the scapula. So wherever there is a lot of friction possible, not any kind of friction, the kind of friction where you have a joint underneath it. And so you would like to cushion that by putting bursi. The bursi also can be under a tendon, like your Achilles tendon. Uh, all the time when you are dorsiflexing and plantar flexing your uh, foot, uh, you are rubbing that Achilles tendon against your uh, calcaneus. And so you would like to protect the two from each other by sliding in a cushion, and that will be filled with synovial fluid, and we call that again bursa. Just please remember that the bursa are outside the synovial joints. They're not really inside. They are put to cushion structures uh, to allow them to slide and move gently over a joint without hurting that tissue, whether that tissue is skin or a tendon um, or even a ligament like your patellar ligament, um, that also will have some synovial sacs or what we call bursi that will help in preventing uh, this kind of friction. We'll see a picture in a little bit and I also picked a couple of pictures of cases that have bursitis which is inflammation of the bursi and you will see how large the bursi can actually become. The cousin of the bursi are what we call tendon sheets and they're the exact same thing but instead of being a sac, a bag, they will form elongated sheets around the tendons and so for example in the rest and the ankle we will see that the tendons were otherwise would rub against the bones or rub against each other and to make sure that they slide and glide faster and easier then we in, 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 in encase them with what we call tendon sheets. So let's have a look here at, at some of these examples. So here is our knee joint for example and here we have a bursa. The bursa can be outside uh, your tendon. So here is between the tendon and your skin or under the tendon. So now this, the function of this bursa will be to protect this tendon from rubbing against the bone inside. We have another bursa here. We have a bursa here on the back to prevent again the skin from hurting itself when it's rubbing against the bone. So these are examples of bursae and we'll see many more of that but these are examples that we find for example here in the knee joint. The tendon sheets on the other hand they will be the same kind of material but instead they will form to you sheets that will surround the tendons like here we have in the hand uh, and in this case it will prevent the damage to these tendons from rubbing either against each other or rubbing against the bone. So we see the difference between the bursi and the tendon sheets. Uh, we understand that whether it's bursi or tendon sheets they are filled with synovial fluid because these sacs or sheets they're really made by the synovial membrane anyways. Okay? So here is some examples of, um, of bursitis. Uh, you can see here is a normal knee and you can see how large the bursa here became. Uh, in the old times they used to call that, uh, I think, maid knee, uh, because um, the house maid knee, because the maids used to be always on their knees um, working on the floor and whatnot. And that was very common injury to them and this is another bursitis we see here at the elbow or the bursa that is protecting uh, the elbow against friction and we see an inflammation here that is very obvious. Treating it with some anti-inflammatory drugs um, will take care of it. Sometimes we use steroids in very rare cases. You go in with uh, aspiration or incision in order to, if there, especially if there is blood, it takes much longer time to um, be removed. All right, so that was the first part of the articulation chapter. In the second part, we will talk more about specific uh, 
um, joints, specific like uh, temporomandibular joint, your shoulder joint, your elbow joint, uh, sternoclavicular joint, uh, your hip joint, your knee joint, and your ankle joints. Um, what we will focus mostly on what makes that joint, but what's more important, what tie the joints together. That means the different ligaments that tie the bones together, and that is would be in our uh, in our second part of this lecture online. All right, have a good day.